John Lennon had a sense of survival in the closing weeks of his life. After spending a decade out of the spotlight, the most vocal and divisive ex-Beatle entered the 1980s with a positive outlook and a fantastic new album, Double Fantasy, which he co-produced with his wife and artistic partner, Yoko Ono. The person who had turned the word peace into a catchphrase for his generation appeared to have at last discovered the inner calm that had eluded him for so long. Lennon had dreams of releasing more albums and perhaps going on tour, but none of those things happened. On Monday, December 8, 1980, just before 11 p.m., the 40-year-old rock legend was shot and killed in front of his Dakota apartment building in New York City. Mark David Chapman, a devoted fan from Hawaii who had spent the entire day loitering outside the Dakota door, was the person who pulled the trigger. Even hours earlier, Lennon had personally autographed Chapman's copy of Double Fantasy. Lennon was taken by police to Roosevelt Hospital, where medical staff was unable to reverse the effects of Chapman's four bullets. On arrival, Lennon's death was confirmed. By chance, as Lennon was brought into surgery, local WABC-TV news producer Alan Weiss was already on a stretcher at Roosevelt Hospital, recovering from a motorbike accident. After Weiss informed his superiors of Lennon's passing, renowned sportscaster Howard Cosell broke the news during Monday Night Football at 11.50 p.m. No matter who wins or loses, this is just a football game. We have to remind ourselves, Cosell remarked. ABC News has confirmed to us a terrible tragedy. John Lennon, outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, the most famous perhaps of all the Beatles, shot twice in the back, rushed to Roosevelt Hospital. On arrival, dead. After hearing that news, it was difficult to resume playing. Ono's tune, Walking on Thin Ice, a frigid art disco thumper that would be released in February 1981, was being finished off by Lennon and him just hours earlier at New York City's Hit Factory studio. When singing lead, Ono delivers lyrics that, in retrospect, seem uncannily prescient. I may cry someday, but the tears will dry whichever way, and when our hearts return to ashes, it'll be just a story. In 2010, Ono questioned if she had foreseen the tragic events that would occur when writing for Rolling Stone. What other way to interpret those lyrics? Ono remarked, I hadn't understood that it read, I may cry someday, not you may cry someday or we may cry someday. What the hell was I thinking? Lennon spoke with Dave Sholin and Lori Kay for the RKO radio network earlier on December 8th before the Hit Factory session. Just two days earlier, Lennon had a talk with BBC reporter Andy Peebles. And three days earlier, he had spent nine hours with Rolling Stone reporter Jonathan Cott. All three of Lennon's final interviews, like Walking on Thin Ice, include devastating passages that are made much more so in light of what would happen in the hours and days that followed. Lennon mentioned in the Rolling Stone interview that once the Beatles experienced their extraordinary worldwide success in the 1960s, supporters in his native England were all too eager to criticize him. Lennon stated, They want dead heroes like Sid Vicious and James Dean. I don't want to be a dead f asking hero, you say. Therefore, forget about them. In an interview with the BBC on December 6th, Lennon discussed every aspect of his career, from his time with the Fab Four to the new wave artists he was just beginning to discover, Madness, the B-52S, Pretenders. Since releasing his last album five years prior, John Lennon had been a stay-at-home dad raising his little son, Sean. Lennon lived a relatively quiet life despite being out of the spotlight. In fact, he was frequently spotted wandering the streets of New York City, where he never had to worry about being pursued by followers. Lennon stated, I've been pacing the streets for the past seven years. I can enter a restaurant right now by walking outside this door. Want to know how amazing that is? Or visit the theater. People will approach you and say hello or ask for autographs, but they won't bother you. On the afternoon of December 8th, hours after photographer Annie Leibovitz had visited the flat to take the pair's now iconic images for Rolling Stone, the RKO crew captured Lennon's final interview inside the Dakota. Happy and energetic, Lennon was eager to talk about the album he and Ono had just published. He found the flower while on vacation in Bermuda with Sean, which served as the inspiration for the title, Double Fantasy. Ono, who had stayed in New York, and John started writing the songs for the album on the same trip. They sung them to each other while talking on the phone, simulating a conversation between a husband and wife. Ono's more experimental songs are interspersed with Lennon's straightforward rock songs on the CD. There are songs that express optimism, such as Just Like Starting Over and Woman, as well as tracks that openly express marital strife, such as I'm Losing You and Moving On. Lennon's Lost Weekend, an 18-month period in the middle of the 1970s marred by substance addiction and infidelity, ended only around five years after the couple started dating. The peace activist who wrote All You Need Is Love and Give Peace a Chance 
admitted in a 1980 interview with Playboy that, all that I used to be cruel to my woman, I beat her and kept her apart from the things that she loved, was me. I used to violently abuse my wife and all women. I had some power. Since I was unable to explain myself, I hit. I hit ladies, and I fought with guys. You see, that is why I constantly talk about peace. People who seek love and peace are typically the most aggressive. The whole opposite is true. But I genuinely think that love and peace exist. I am a violent man who regrets his aggressiveness and has learned not to be violent. Before I can publicly apologize for how I treated women when I was younger, I will need to be a lot older. On Double Fantasy, Lennon and Ono felt it was crucial to show all aspects of their relationship. Lennon told RKO, we're not advertising ourselves as the ideal couple. We experience issues. We've experienced issues. Undoubtedly, we'll experience issues. I mean, we're trying, you know. We want to remain a unit. We aspire to be a family. The offspring of the 1960s who had survived Vietnam and Watergate and were now settling into family life and trying to figure out what happens next were the folks of Lennon's generation, he remarked throughout the double fantasy press cycle. I'm actually saying, here I am now, to the individuals who grew up with me. What's up? How are things in your relationship? Did you finish it all? Said Lennon. Didn't you think the 1970s were a drag? Let's attempt to make the 1980s good now that we are here, you know? We still need to make the best use of it after all. We do have some influence over it. I continue to believe in love, peace, and positive thinking when I am able to. Although I don't always feel optimistic, I try to convey it when I do. For RKO reporter Lori Kay, the interview had a profound impact on her life. In her new book, Confessions of a Rock and Roll Name Dropper, Kay discusses her talk with Lennon as well as many other topics. As Kay explains to Mental Floss, John was extremely happy to have been what he called a house husband while raising his five-year-old son, Sean, and totally enjoying his relationship with his wonderful wife, who was also working non-stop running their long-running business. John was looking forward to a lifetime of happiness and creativity with the love of his life. He wanted to keep recording music and talked about touring as well. Lennon and Ono left the Dakota after the interview with Sholin and the RKO crew, who were going to the airport to board a flight back to San Francisco. Lennon requested the RKO employees to give him a ride after the car he had scheduled to transport him and Ono to the hit factory, failed to arrive for some reason. A silent admirer carrying an overcoat approached Lennon with a copy of Double Fantasy before they boarded the limousine. Lennon inquired, Would you like your album signed? The man nodded, and Paul Goresh, another fan, snapped a picture as John Lennon signed the album. As Lennon boarded the limousine, Goresh took one more picture. As the automobile accelerated away, the ex-Beatle allegedly grinned and waved. These would be John Lennon's last live pictures. Mark David Chapman, the man with the overcoat, lingered outside the Dakota while Lennon and Ono finished walking on thin ice. After the session, the pair made the decision to eat out, but Lennon insisted on seeing Sean one last time before the child went to bed. They returned to the Dakota and halted there, where Chapman was waiting with his. 38. Unique. Chapman fired the shots that would be heard all over the world as Lennon went toward the structure. Lennon's murder resembled a political assassination more than it did a death of a famous person. The following morning, after returning home to San Francisco, Sholin from RKO was informed of the tragedy. He stopped his automobile, hoping it was just a nightmare. How could the charming, kind man he had spoken with earlier in the day be gone? Years later, Sholin advised, Never take a day for granted. I'll tell you that, because life can change on a dime. Since Kay remained in New York City that evening and had dinner with a friend, she was the one who heard the terrible news before Sholin. Kay hurried to Roosevelt Hospital as soon as she heard a radio broadcast about the incident and found Yoko crying like crazy while holding on to a friend. After spending the evening providing statements to other reporters, Kay was later invited to appear on the Today Show. Kay has always felt strangely guilty about the events of December 8, 1980, which she considers to be both the finest and worst day of her life as she goes into great detail about in her new book. This is partly because as she left Lennon's building after the interview, she ran into Chapman, a man whose name she still won't say or even type. In addition, Kay claims that as she left the Dakota, she was compelled to speak with the man who shot John. That creep incessantly approached me and inquired, did you chat to him? Do you have his autograph? Was repeatedly asked. I still can't help but blame myself for not alerting the Dakota's security personnel to the presence of a repulsive pain in the ass loitering outside the apartment complex. If only I had brought it up to them. Fans who were in shock held vigils in the days that followed. Ono requested that mourners observe a moment of silence for 10 minutes on Sunday, December 14th. In Liverpool, England, Lennon's homeland, about 20,000 people gathered at St. George's Hall, 
while an estimated 50,000 to 100,000 people gathered in front of the Dakota and in nearby Central Park. The only sound heard throughout those 10 minutes, according to news accounts from New York City, was the spinning of chopper blades. Fans at Central Park were questioned by WNBC reporters about their thoughts throughout those 10 minutes. One individual expressed his hope that the assassination will result in stricter gun laws so that Lenin's death wouldn't have been in vain. A small youngster claimed that Lenin would have approved of the silence. What people drew from Lenin's life and music seemed to be best captured by a woman with the tiniest hint of a smile. He believed in peace, don't you know? She spoke. What else can I say? Simply take a look around. It completely tells the story. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to my channel, and hitting the notification bell. By doing so, you'll let me know that you liked this content and that I should create more videos like this in the future. Your support means the world to me, and it encourages me to keep making valuable and entertaining content for you. Don't forget to leave a comment too. I love hearing your thoughts and suggestions. Thank you again and I'll see you in the next video.